everybody. I'm so glad to be with you all today and help you kind of wrap up and close what I know has been a fabulous uh, conference. So you probably all are full of information and you may not have any more space to pack in more information. Well, here's the good news. My goal is that I actually leave you with less than you have now, so you'll have a little more space, right? That's like when you get to the end and you need, need room for dessert, you can snap your fingers and make room. So my job is to leave you with a little more space than you had before. So I'm gonna be talking about the mindset for transformation. And I've been, as you heard, I've been at work on this question of transformation from before we started calling it transformation. There was a time when innovation was the buzzword. Now it's transformation. I don't know what it'll be next. But I do know that we're in a time of profound disruption and transformative change. And every leader in every organization is trying to figure out what to do. But what I've found over the last 25 years working in this field is that it's not about what we're going to do. You have to start with how you think. And if you want to transform what you do, you have to start by transforming how you think. Because if you do new things with old ways of thinking, at best you get incremental change. Now, think about the last time you were in a meeting where a problem or an opportunity came up. What does everybody go straight to? What are we gonna do about it, right? What are we gonna do? How many times have you been in a meeting where people said, how should we think about this? Let's come up, let's brainstorm ways of thinking versus what to do. There's a wonderful quote from Abraham Lincoln, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. I believe that our thinking, our mental models, are the equivalent of sharpening the ax. And if you spent a little more time at the beginning of the meeting getting the thinking right, the doing would get really easy. We are in a time of transformative change. It is as if the landscape around us is changing. I live in Boston, this is a picture of the Big Dig, when all of the highways that were above ground were buried below ground. Back when this happened, we didn't have smartphones yet, it was the, remember the GPS devices? Well, what was it about those compared to the smartphone? The maps didn't update. You got the map that came with the device. So what happened is after the big dig, all of those devices didn't work so well anymore. You had to update the map. Well, the same thing's happening for us. All the roads, the landscape of business and organization and culture and leadership and marketing and strategy have all changed but we still have the old maps. We have to update those maps. The challenge is that as human beings, we see the new through the lens of the old. This is both a challenge and an opportunity. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. So back when the automobile came into being, we didn't call it an automobile. What did we call it? A horseless carriage, because it was like a horse-drawn carriage but it didn't have a horse. By the way, um, what do we call autonomous vehicles today? Driverless cars. Some things don't change. Do you think that in, you pick the date, how many years until we've converted over? 50 years, 20 years, whatever. Do you think that 50 years from now we're gonna be calling them driverless cars? People are gonna say, what's a driver? If you really wanna see this one, Next time you're in, in Microsoft Word, look at the icon for save. What is it? A floppy disk. If you have kids, ask your kids what is that. They'll say, the icon for saving your file. All right. That would be like Spotify having the logo of an eight track tape. All right, what do you see that he's steering with? Here's another version of this. It's not reins, but it's not a steering wheel. It's the tiller of a boat, basically, 
That was the inspiration, because that's the model we had. How do you steer a big mechanical thing? So we tend to bring the old into the new. Now, what happens is the new is scary. So we have to design ways of helping people deal with the change, because if it's too much of a jump, a steering wheel was probably too much in the beginning. So a tiller was the right thing to do. Here was one creative horseless carriage manufacturer solution to dealing with the fear and anxiety that people had about these you know, wild machines roaming the streets. I'll put a fake horse head on the front so it looks familiar. <laughs> but we're doing it today. This is one of the versions of a driverless car. What does that look like on the front? A person's face, a happy face. OK, what's really odd about this picture? What is it on the sides of the car? Rear view mirrors. Why does a driverless car near rear view mirrors? Who's looking in them? <laughs> but it would look really odd if it didn't. And then the face wouldn't have ears. So you kind of need it for that. So this is what happens. People say, look, you guys know this better than anybody. What is it people say about change? People resist change. That's what we deal with day in, day out. I'm here to say the rather heretical notion that People are not as resistant to change as you think. Actually, people are as exactly resistant to change as they think. If you want to get people to change, you have to do three things. You've got to convince them that they need to change. If you think about a trapeze act, you've got to convince them that the rope on the bar that they're on is fraying and is going to give way. But what if they're hanging from that bar and they know the rope is going to give way. You've gotten them over the denial that they need to change. If there's no net, and there's never a net, what are your options? You're going you're to hang on to that bar as long as you can. There's nowhere else to go. We don't give people the new bar to jump to. We tell them what to do, jump, but we don't give them the new bar, which is the new way of thinking. And so they keep hanging onto the bar, and we keep yelling at them to jump. So the trick is to give them not only something to do, but a new way to think, where they can see how they can fulfill what was important to them before in a better way with the new bar. But that process of going from the old bar to the new bar requires not just learning, but unlearning. You have to be willing to let go of the old bar. It doesn't mean getting rid of it. It means that you have the capacity to choose how to think, that you can go back and forth between the bars. You've had an experience of this if you've ever been in a country where they drive on the other side of the road. I've learned to not say the wrong side of the road, depending on who's in the audience. We'll just say the other side of the road. So if you've been to London, if you're American, vice versa, you know that in the beginning, it's very disorienting. Looking right as a pedestrian, driving on the other side. But the hard part is not driving or walking on the other side. It's unlearning the familiar way of thinking about it. And there are lots of examples of this you can start to see where you've had to develop a new way of thinking and learning. And let me give you an example. It's the perfect natural experiment of how we bring the old way of thinking into the new and the challenge and opportunity of unlearning. So you all know Wikipedia, I assume. Does anyone know what Wikipedia was before it was Wikipedia? And I don't mean Encyclopedia Britannica or even Encarta. I mean literally what the team that built Wikipedia built before Wikipedia. All right, don't worry about it. There's only one person that has ever known the answer to this. And if you doubt me, you can look this up on Wikipedia. <laughs> it was called Newpedia. Now, I want you to read what it says, right? It's building the world's largest international peer-reviewed encyclopedia. It's free. It was on the web. Submit articles. It looks a lot like Wikipedia. But they did more than get a better logo and a better name. 
The difference was they had a mental model of how an encyclopedia worked. So what did that mean? That meant that articles got submitted to editors, editors edited, reviewed and approved, and then published the articles. A seven-step approval process. It starts to seem a little more familiar to regular corporate America, doesn't it? How many articles do you think they published the first year? 21. If you're trying to build the world encyclopedia of knowledge, like, that's going to take a long time. We would have had driverless cars everywhere before they were going to be done. So what did they do? Well, we know what they did. They opened the whole thing up so that readers became editors. And then 18,000 articles in the first year. But what was at the core of the shift? It was not the technology. That was the same. It was not the business model. That was the same. It was not even really the product. It was the mental model. Because they had a horseless carriage view of how an encyclopedia was going to work, in which readers and editors were different groups, and it was about production. And instead, they shifted their thinking to say, this is going to be about co-creation. And we are going to challenge this notion that readers and editors are different people. So if you start with an exponential technology, if you apply incremental thinking, you're going to get incremental results. It's only when you apply that exponential thinking that you can get the exponential results. It's the shift in thinking that has to precede the shift in doing. And so what this looks like is in a 10% versus a 10x world, as leaders, as traditional leaders, we're very good at producing incremental results. Get that steady progress. But if we want to be disruptive leaders, we're going to have to deliver exponential results. So I want to show you kind of a way of thinking about these different worlds so you can start to create that ambidexterity, that unlearning capacity to move between these different mental models or these ways of thinking. I'm going to propose that most of what we do day in and day out is like building a block tower. We have a mission. We have very clearly defined roles. I'm going to build the tower. You're going to feed me the blocks. We're going to focus a lot on risk. Don't let that block tower fall. And we're going to measure the steady progress of how we get to our goal. That's a linear incremental world. At times, we're going to work on big scale kinds of things. I'm going to suggest this is like one of these big domino projects. You're going to line up all the dominoes. By the way, if you find this fascinating, just YouTube has like more domino things than you have any idea. It's like a whole subculture of domino spirals and all sorts of things. But it, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole. Just be, be careful. So, this is still linear incremental, one domino at a time. But this would be the equivalent of not just, let's say, a project, but a product launch going into a new market, a change effort. But we still have a mental model of kind of one thing steady at a time. But I'll just let you watch that, because it's cool. <laughs> right? All right. Now, those of, some of you are like, ooh. All right. Now I know what you're doing tonight. OK. So let me show you what exponential looks like. Well, hopefully the sound is going to work. We can see for ourselves what Great. exponential growth looks like by doing a little experiment. And if we can bring one of the handheld cameras in, we can have a look at this. So in this box, I have 225 armed mouse traps, And on each mouse trap, we have a ping pong ball. Now in a moment, we're going to take one more ping pong ball, and we're going to drop it in through this hole in the top. And it's going to set off a chain reaction. And in this chain reaction, the number of ping pong balls flying through the air is going to grow exponentially. OK, so who would like to volunteer to come and set this off? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Um, let's have you there. Yeah. And what's your name? Matthew. Matthew. Matthew, you'd like to hold that. Mm -hmm. Now, in a moment, we're going to give you a 3, 2, 1 countdown. OK? When we get to go, all I want you to do is to place the ball in through that little hole at the top. You manage that? Yeah? Yep. OK. Are we ready? 
three, two, one, go. <laughs> Amazing, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so, so we have a high-speed camera that was looking at that, and perhaps we can just do a little action replay and see that in slow motion. So there's the first ball, setting off a couple more. Each of those is setting off several more. And on that curve, we can see the number of balls growing in this very dramatic way. But what's really impressive about exponential growth is that the rate of growth is itself growing exponentially. So how do you feel in that world? If we compare the world of the block, the domino, and the mousetrap, what's different about the mousetrap? What's that? Yeah. So if you're a manager, but think about it this way. So if you're a manager responsible for getting something done, how do you feel in that spring-loaded world? Not in control, right? Like, because what, what do you not control? You don't control the balls. The blocks and the dominoes, you know exactly where it's going. And those balls are going you don't know where. So the key thing is, but you like the results. I mean, accelerating speed, isn't this, that's kind of what the result is what we're all after in our organizations, that kind of dynamic, innovation, spontaneity, agility, all those things. But we can't control something. It turns out we can control some things. We can control how strong the springs are, what the ping pong balls weigh, the size of the box, how far apart the mouse traps all are, where the hole got drilled to drop it in, who dropped it in. Lots of things we can control, but not what the balls do. And this is the challenge of our time. How do you let go without losing control? And the secret to this is, we are accustomed in this incremental 10% world to manage people, process, plans, blocks and dominoes. The exponential world is one of managing through purpose and principles. And let me tell you why this is true and what you can do and how to think about making that leap into the new trapeze bar. And it's not that the 10% goes away you're still gonna build block towers and domino spirals. But you want to foster in your organization the capacity to create those spring-loaded ping pong network effects. Because that's what that fundamentally is. The network effect of how the balls interact with each other and keep going after they knock another ball on its head. Whereas the blocks and dominoes are used once and done. The reason for the network effect being so important is because for 400 years we were in a world in which communication was one way. By the way, this is basically my whole PhD in the next three slides, so we're already compressing time from too many years to three slides. So Gutenberg's revolution, one-way communication, the internet comes along, the audience starts talking back, and then people realize, wait a minute, why are we standing in this field talking back at the guy in the megaphone? We can do this ourselves. So you get an Amish barn raising effect where we don't need an architect and a builder, we're gonna build this ourselves. We are a community of co-creators. So instead of the one way, deliver, distribute, persuade, promote, drive change with some feedback loops, that kind of tell us how we're doing, this is where the action is. How are employees and customers and influencers and others connecting and collaborating? And now, this is the let go without losing control. How do we enable and empower that to happen? But the hard part of that is we aren't used to having influence where we're not in the room. Because that bottom arrow is we don't have direct visibility. You may know this kind of joke, the street light effect. I'm looking for my quarter. Did you drop it here? No, a couple blocks down the street. Why are you looking for it here? Well, the light's better. <laughs> we look where the light is. I can measure it. I can see it. 
But that ping pong effect, you don't control that. We don't like when we can't control things, so we stick to what we can control. But what that gives us is the limitations, if we're only in the Britannica or the Newpedia world, is you can be incremental at best. The Wikipedia model requires enabling and empowering those connections. How did they do that? I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But fundamentally, it was enabling the balls to know what to do and where to go on their own. And that's what empowerment really means. Not delegation, empowerment. So the first way to get those balls to know what they should be doing is give them a shared purpose. So they're really clear, oh, my job is to knock the other balls. OK, good. So this shared purpose is really at the core of it. Purpose has become popular. I think there are three, how do you think about purpose? Three different ways. There's a purpose two, which is transactional. It's about consumption. That's where your value proposition is. Then there is a purpose four. What do you contribute in the world? This is your values, this is your philanthropy, your corporate social responsibility, your mission, likely, of what value you contribute to the world. But it's not enough to unlock the ping pong effect. The ping pong effect happens when you have a purpose with, the co-creation, where everyone has the same purpose. So if we think about Britannica having a good value proposition, production, Newpedia had a purpose four of contribution, Wikipedia tapped into the shared purpose, where the readers, the editors, everyone was at work on the same thing, building the world's largest free encyclopedia. And the test is, who wears the shirt? Does it, well, first, does it belong on a shirt? Is it inspirational enough? But right now, when I look at the mission statements that people would say is a, a noble purpose, only the employees get to wear the shirt. Do your customers, your partners, your influencers, your regulators, whoever, are they on board for that purpose too? Are you sharing that purpose with the world? That's what unlocks the network effect. I like the example of Sephora because it shows how they've evolved that purpose. So they started as the beauty authority, a purpose two. Then it was transforming beauty, a purpose four. Then it became let's beauty together, a purpose with. And now it's about being fearless. Who doesn't want that? If your mission, if the answer to your mission statement isn't who doesn't want that and that everyone can contribute to it, then there's an opportunity for you to raise it even further. Airbnb is not in the hospitality business. They're certainly not in the hotel or call it what you will, room rental business. They will tell you very explicitly they are in the belonging business. Who doesn't want that? And everything they do is to enable hosts and guests to create a sense of belonging. You can think about this also through the lens of metrics, which is we have lots of metrics that measure our purpose too, increasingly metrics for our purpose for, triple bottom line and so on. But think about what that purpose metric would be for a purpose with. How do you know whether you're creating more belonging? Pinterest sees itself as an inspiration engine. They have an index of how much inspiration they've created. Not how many likes and views and users and all that. Are we creating inspiration in the world? Patagonia, I had the good fortune of working with Patagonia on one of their board meetings. They spend the first half of the board meeting talking about the state of the planet and the second half of the board meeting talking about the state of the business to make sure that they're generating the profits that enable them to have the impact on the planet that they want to have. And the result is that they're the most, most loyal, profitable, successful retailer in their category. And the same thing, by the way, for Sephora. So what you want to do is you want to start to evolve what we typically think of as that path to purchase or it might even be for an employee a path to hiring or a path to learning, whatever that is, into, whoop, let's go back. Can we do that? There we are. Into a path to purpose. 
How is it that that purpose is going to be fulfilled? What is everyone's contribution, like a potluck dinner? What's everyone bringing to the table that's going to contribute to that purpose being fulfilled? And this changes the nature of storytelling and the way in which we communicate who we are and what we do. So I'm going to distinguish between a story and a narrative. A story is where I tell you something about me. It has a predetermined outcome. It has you be the audience. But there's no opportunity for co-creation here. A narrative is something we create together. It's open-ended. Now you're a participant. Let's build the world's largest free encyclopedia together versus look what we have for you. But the real power of this is when we evolve from a kind of value proposition transactional lens of why should I buy something from you or participate in this or fill in the blank, whatever verb is relevant for you, where the answer is really what will I get if I do? The power of a shared purpose and a narrative around that purpose is that it becomes why should I have a relationship with you? What is that relationship? And most importantly, who will I be if I do? Airbnb, I am someone who belongs. Sephora, I am fearless. That's a lot more powerful than I get really good, cheap, organic makeup, right? The basis of advantage today is identity because all of the traditional institutions of identity have broken down. And if you can create a sense of identity with your employees, with your customers, with whoever, you win. What that requires, though, is a new way of thinking about culture and management. And the challenge we're facing today is that there's a trade-off between alignment and autonomy. So in the hierarchy, it's really good for consistency, and we've been in this world of of alignment, and then we want more agility, so we go to autonomy, and we loosen the reins, and we delegate, and we empower, and we flatten the organization. Some of you have been through this. I call this the organizational whiplash. Well, we're going to loosen the reins to get more innovation and agility. It's like, oh, no, that's a little crazier and more chaotic than we thought it would go. All right, we're just going to pull the reins in a little bit. Just a little more alignment. Oh, you're disempowered? Okay, well, here's a little bit more rope. Now nah, that's a little too crazy. All right, well, just bring it, right? Familiar? You need both. How do you get both? The key is to focus your culture not on values, which are important, but values don't tell you which way to go when you come to the fork in the road. And that's where we have to focus, is where are these forks in the road? And the way that we do it today, we have our mission goals, strategy values, that tells us where to go, our rules, process, policies, procedures, that tells us what to do, and we use management in the middle on how to decide. Who has the decision rights? But it takes too long to keep escalating things up the chain. It doesn't actually empower people. So we need organizations that have alignment and autonomy. So here's one, a flock of birds. Alignment, that's not chaos, but autonomy. There's no leader there. This is what you want your organizations to be. Agile, fluid. So how do they do that? Well, it turns out three simple principles. The decision, which way to go? That's the question the bird's always asking itself. Encoded, genetically, three principles. Stick together, follow your neighbors, and don't collide. Especially if it's something that can eat you. And that's all it takes. No one is in charge. So simple decision principles can give us an alternative to management. Not that management goes away, but where we need to flock, where we need that ping pong effect, we need to empower people with principles and purpose that enable them to take action. And this is how Wikipedia went from Newpedia to Wikipedia, because they developed a shared purpose, create the encyclopedia, and principles that are 
subject to interpretation. The military is something called doctrine. That's the equivalent of principles. They enable people to make better decisions. Notice, written from a neutral point of view. What does that mean? Well, it has to be interpreted. Authoritative, but requires judgment and application. And notice the last one. Here are four rules. And the last one is we don't have firm rules. Don't let it turn into authority, where it's alignment without autonomy. And the power of it is that whereas values are usually just universal, you can think of these like Russian dolls, where you're nesting inside of each other. So within the neutral point of view is another set of principles that enables the community to know what qualifies as a neutral point of view. By the way, the Agile movement started with 16 people and four principles. Those four principles became 16 principles, which then became a set of practices. There's power in the principles with that shared purpose of creating a new model for software development. So what this means for you as a leader is you have to shift your thinking about who you are as a leader. We normally think of leaders as being about the qualities of a person, the skills and abilities that we have. And there's an evolved and probably the leading edge way of thinking about leadership is that it's really your role on the team, like the lead goose in a, in, in a V formation where it rotates and it's really about having followers, that definition of a leader is someone with followers. But if you think about this ping pong box or the flock, then a leader is someone who can design the system that empowers people to take action in a way that contributes to a shared purpose and aligns with the principles in order to create the desired effect. So if the 10% world is that you set realistic goals, you follow the plan, block tower, minimize risk, standardize, centralize decision making, expand your authority, make your numbers by managing people and process. As someone said to me once, Mark, that's the job. It is part of the job now, but there's another opportunity, which is the world of the 10X, which is its ambitious goals that don't necessarily look realistic in the moment. It's a vision beyond the plan. You're focusing on maximizing learning over minimizing risk, personalizing, empowering decision making, not just centralizing it, influence beyond where you have authority, growing your network in order to make your numbers, and managing with purpose and principles. This is the new bar. And we have to enable people to jump to that bar and bring it close enough. So one of the aspects of the narrative is, is that you have a new role relationship. And today, all of you are really good at, at being managers. You wouldn't be here if you weren't good at managing. I'm going to suggest that in addition to that, you start to think of yourself not just as managers, but as multipliers. How do you create that network effect in your organization? By empowering decision making by getting things to happen beyond what you can directly see and enabling a new kind of result to be produced in a new kind of way. So I'm gonna open it up now to questions if you, if you have any um, or comments, whatever it is, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I really appreciate not only um, Degreed for having me, but also that we've talked about a partnership in which we're gonna start to make this material available to you um, through the Degreed platform as a pathway or what we would call a shift expedition. So you can look for that because in some ways this is kind of, it takes practice to move to that new bar, right? And so we want to make sure that you're able to do that. And if you, you do want to see more about it, you can go to shift.2 uh, and we've got lots of articles and so on there. So, um, questions or observations or how this resonates for you? Yes, up here I think, are we bringing mics around? Yes, we are, so if you wouldn't mind waiting, one is coming your way so everyone can hear you. And, oh, there we go, all right, now I can see. Oh, thank you. Perfect, thank you. I'm, I've always been curious about the unlearning part of learning. 
think about the last time you struggled with unlearning, because you're a bit of an expert, I would assume, but I would also assume you might still struggle. Is there a time recently that you've had to unlearn, to relearn? Yeah, well, one of the core ones was, I mean, my sure. background, I've done a lot of different things. Um, so I was the SVP of communities and networks at Sears for a while, which is a whole other story. But I'm really trained as a consultant. And when I started shift thinking, I came in with a consulting mindset, which is like, okay, I'm gonna methodology and I'm gonna train a team and we're gonna then help organizations and drive the change and deliverables and so on. And I just realized, A, it was incremental, and B, it was not really gonna produce new capability. That there's something inherent in that model that kind of, you know, people have to learn how to do it themselves. How do you teach people to fish? And so I had to unlearn my kind of consulting mindset. And I sometimes you need to do a deliverable and so on. We create narratives for organizations and so on. But I had to unlearn being a consultant, like the manager to multiplier. And, and one of the real unlocks was when I found, oh, well, what's the other bar? It's not enough to say, you know, you hear this, like, I'm a recovering consultant. Well, OK, that's horseless carriage. What am I? And when I realized, oh, I'm a catalyst. So a catalyst in chemistry is something that accelerates a reaction without being used up in the process. I really liked the without being used up in the process. But it was like, okay, I'm gonna be a multiplier here and I'm gonna teach people to fish and we're gonna build capability. And instead of training up consultants to deliver things, I'm gonna find people in the client organization and train them up. And then they'll be left with real capability. So that was a huge unlearning, is to say, what's a different model that will achieve the results better than the one before? Great question. Yeah. So you want, it, it relates to this role relationship, like I am a consultant, I am a catalyst. So my favorite on this one was working with a technology company in their data analytics business, where kind of who are they, like as an identity, and what we came to, it's a great story, but I'll, I'll hone in. The key thing that they identified is like, all right, we're really about mission critical kind of assignments. And so we really brainstorm like, well, what's an identity? What's a role there? So at first we looked at like, well, being a kind of like lead, someone who leads a scuba diving group, because that's mission critical. But they're not really the leader. They were like, no, we kind of, the client is the, is the star. We want to support them. And then someone had the idea, well, it's like Q for James Bond. If you remember, Q's the one who was like, James, this is a pen that turns into a helicopter, right? <laughs> and so like, oh, we're like Q, and then now we're walking in and it's not, well, what keeps you up at night? It's, what's your assignment? What's your mission? What are the tools that you need? And it completely energized the whole, not the sales force, the organization, because now they're like, okay, what's the next assignment? And what can we come up with? And what are the best tools? And it was a shift in their identity, not just a, here's the value proposition and we're really good at mission critical. Like, it's, those things are still there, but people got to feel who they are in a different way. Thank you. Yeah. We have one over here. Sorry, where are we? There we are. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Uh, what advice would you give to aspiring disruptive leaders who are swimming in a sea of traditional leaders? <laughs> um, well, you first have to, I, well, you first have to validate where people are. That's where I think people get off base is like, there's a kind of like, well, you're being traditional, you're being whatever. You have to understand that they are hanging on the bar for good reason. And so there's first a kind of in yourself, a validation of understanding and an empathy for why they are the way they are, and not just telling them they need to jump. Do you, are you actually giving them a new way of thinking that addresses their core needs? And most of the time I find that's not the case. That the disruptors are kind of saying, well, we need to disrupt and you're being traditional and you're holding things back, but uh, okay, that's not, that's not enough. So the first thing is what's the mental model people are in and what's a new way of thinking that they can embrace? 
And how do you reassure them that they are going to have, and this is a different way in which identity comes in, that they are still going to have meaning and purpose and contribution in that new world? Because otherwise their fear and anxiety overwhelms them. That even if they see that there is a new bar, it feels too far away. So that's, it's a, it's a, there's, much, there's a lot more to that question. Maybe we can do that over, over the cocktails. But did you have a follow-up there? OK, that's good. All right, that was a thumbs up. All right, we've got a couple more here. Yes. Hey, hey Mark, Bill Beagle from Verizon. How are you? Great. <laughs> so when you think of multipliers, right, and um, I'm just curious if you have any insight or thoughts on how that could impact kind of the hierarchical organization within companies. The key to it is, is that you, mo most people today are trying to undo the hierarchy, the holacracy movement and so on, which ends up being just a hierarchy of networks. You want to leave the hierarchy alone. You want to create the network that cuts across. The best example of this was John Patrick at IBM when the internet was first coming in. There's a great case study of this in Fast Company from a lot of years ago. He created this network of people who were interested in the internet, and it, it cut across the whole hierarchy. So you create that network of people, network effect among the people who believe in the change. And I like to say it's not top down or bottom up, which keeps you in the hierarchical mental model. It's a ripple out. And you keep bringing more people along who share those purpose and those principles. So they start to create almost a parallel organization that, that can overlap with the hierarchy. Don't attack the hierarchy. It's kind of like, don't, you know, this is also relates to disruptors. Don't attack what already exists. You just, you, you stimulate that immune response. You, you want to transcend it, not attack it. So there's one question I, I often get, which is kind of how do you elevate something, how do you elevate learning, skill development, all of the things that you guys work on day in, day out. How do you make this a strategic conversation? How do you get the CEO to care or whoever the senior executive is? And one of the things that I find in working with senior executives is that this idea of mindset is really critical today. And they understand that they need to change the thinking of the organization, that they need a new mindset of some kind. And what you want to figure out is, what is the trapeze bar of that mindset shift? What is the existing mental model and the new model? And you can always tell a mental model from the language that people are using. And there are a variety of journeys that people are on today and companies are on regarding that mindset shift. There's a big one around product-centric to customer-centric. And even within customer-centric, is it about getting the customer to do what you want them to do, or about getting the organization to do what the customer wants you to do? There's another one about incremental to exponential. There's another one about kind of you know, inflexible to agile, bureaucratic to entrepreneurial. Just listen for the language of how the CEO or the executive team are talking about what needs to happen and go to work on helping people shift the thinking before they start shifting the doing. Because that change in thinking, I find executives are there, and they don't necessarily even have a language for it. And when you can start to give them a way of thinking about what they're saying needs to happen, you have a seat at the table. So it also relates to this kind of how to be disruptive in traditional. It's, it's be a thought partner on helping people have a way of thinking about what they're doing. And even this conversation about unlearning is a very powerful one. It's a simple idea. Just have the question to a team, hey, what do we need to unlearn to be successful here? What's our unlearning agenda? We know what we need to learn. What do we need to unlearn? So that's often a really great place to start. So with that, I am out of time. It's been great to be with you. I'll be around if you have other questions uh, over drinks. I thank you for having me here. And I can tell by your questions that you're in the thick of it. And I look forward to hearing more about your questions, observations, and experiences as well as we go on this journey together. So thank you very much. <laughs>